Dave Setter writes about social and environmental issues, including the intersection of the built and natural worlds. His poetry is informed by his career in env environmental enforcement geared toward protecting drinking water and helping to heal the scars of mineral extraction in the Western US. Dave's new book is called Don't Sing to Me of Electric Fences and is published by Cherry Grove Collections. Dave's poems have won the Knock Ecolit a prize, prize, received third place in the William Matthews competition and received honorable mention in the Patterson Literary Review's Allen Ginsberg competition. He's the recipient of two Pushcart nominations. Dave has been an affiliate artist at the Headland Center for the Arts and has served on the board of Marin Poetry Center. He earned his undergrad degree in civil engineering from Princeton University and his graduate degree in humanities from Dominican University. Born in Chicago, Dave now lives in Sonoma County. Please welcome Dave Setter. Great. Thank you, Sandy. <clears throat> well, uh, thank you, Sandy, for all you do for the poetry community. And I especially appreciate the fact that you read the student poem, Rainforests. And I also wanted to note we have a new Sonoma County Youth po Poet Laureate, Ella Wen from Maria Carrillo High School. So good thing to support the youth in their poetry. And uh, it's a pleasure to read here tonight with Chuck. Chuck enjoyed your poems very much. Uh, I see a lot of friendly faces on the Zoom screen, including some of my former colleagues from the Environmental Protection Agency. So hello, guys. And thanks everyone for joining us for an evening of poetry. Uh, <clears throat> Sandy has already introduced me, but uh, I'm Dave Setter, and I'm a feminist. Jack Hammer. I didn't like working a jackhammer, but the boss said it's raucous locker room chatter made me a man. And as I walk past construction sites, I see those same knives of stubble in the faces of workmen who call out to passing women. Chatter, chatter, chatter is the sound they call the part of the jackhammer that cuts the blade. This is the thing. Some people have strong ideas on what it means to be a man, bulk in the shoulders, beer on the breath and in the gut, a roughness toward everything. The view, it must be one bent or broken. Why did they want to make me one of them? My ancestors knew the hard work of spruce, how living things adapt to landscape. I survive by knowing even the hardest case when cut still sweetly bleeds. So uh, all of the poems I'm reading tonight come from Don't Sing to Me of Electric Fences, which is appearing as a ghost image on the screen here. So yeah, there it is. Uh, fresh off the press, more or less, from Cherry Grove Collections. And the, uh, the title of the collection comes from the last line of a poem called Open Range. And so I'll read that poem next, Open Range. This otherwise calm basin ringed with hills was once a caldera, inactive now, but capable of fire that could melt the fakery of this car, bold in appearance, but with a weak heart that whines. At altitude, it can't handle this hundred degree heat, on the way out of Boise, the sound of my approach scares a few sage grouse into sight, and I watch their low flight with the longing of a city kid uncaged. Driving across the Snake River to deal with mining scars and meet 
with tribal councils. I hope wild horses mean it's not too late. Reflexively, I wonder about the meaning of home, what it would be like fighting for a way of life, told where to go to live, having grown up myself roaming, my own heritage fading into each move. I slow for a steer. He stares me down, meets me in the middle, this ribbon of roadway, the car seethes, standing still. So I pull to the shoulder, switch off the ignition, admire the steer so comfortable in its hide. Who will win the day, this open range? If I say he smiles, call me crazy, but do no harm and don't sing to me of electric fences. So the, uh, the cover image of the book and the image that I'm using for my background uh, are both uh, where this poem is set. And so uh, it's set in the Great Basin Desert on the Idaho Nevada border near the Duck Valley Reservation. Well, for the next poem, I'll take us back to a well-known tourist spot in the Bay Area. I think you'll know where it is. Mission Blues. I remember coming across them making love in public. The Golden Gate Bridge tourist overlook was a buzz with everyone else looking away, looking up into the international orange sky. I can't prove a thing, but back home, my in-house field biologist told me what I had seen, a reproductive cycle. And I said, my eye, they were back to back. And she said, that's the way they do it. In my world, back to back meant rejection, cocktail party technique of the turned shoulder. People seem so missionary. The Golden Gate Bridge holds the bent and riveted pose steelworkers gave it and the tourists genuflect. A week later, I said, come back with me. She said that part of their life is over. What's my shade of mission? What's my degree of blue? Knowing my field biologist wasn't in house, but outdoors, luminous in olive drab her eyelids tipped with fog. If you must know, it was just the mission blue butterflies and me hiking through fog to escape the fog. Drifting among acres of coastal scrub, they appeared to me like cigarette wrappers. One male, one female, one blue, one brown, clinging to a lupin snag back to back or not like cigarette wrappers, but scraps of a letter in a language I didn't understand. Well, the seasons are turning. It's cold and rainy and foggy in Petaluma today. And it's been that way for a while over the last few weeks, except for some bright sunny days. And so it kind of makes sense to start thinking about the winter solstice and we'll soon be turning from the dark back into the light. Uh, the dark when it's not uh, foggy and rainy is, is great for uh, stargazing though. And uh, one of my favorite constellations from childhood, Orion, makes an appearance in this poem. And the title is Winter Solstice Yosemite Valley. Starlight thrills, opens ceilings, walls, calls people out from rented cabins, beds, to wander dirty floorboards, says, don't go back to bed, stay. A sleepless solstice, a cabin's back porch, perfect for guessing at the meaning of Orion, arm raised, perfect for asking why, 
we wake at all from sleep. Bare-armed black oaks crowd the lawn, reach up, entangle Orion's latticework. But it's already been broken. The stars speed slowly apart, their penalty for having been. Mythmakers say Orion's bright heel, Rigel, glows in blame for misplaced lust. What's not to understand? We, pun we punish ourselves for decisions made in the dark. The light others mine, we give away color, clarity cut. We bruise our fingers with hardness. Across the valley floor, sentinel rock broods, but once flowed hot like skin loving bones out in the open before ceilings, before walls. All right, I'm gonna do a time check, Sandy. Do I have time for two more? All right, we'll do two more. I wanted to read this poem in particular because um, I, I wanna offer my sympathy for, uh, to anyone who's lost a loved one in the past few years and especially to the pandemic. Um, I lost my mother a few years ago, but I was touched by the kindness and gentleness of hospice workers. And so this poem is about hospice, even though the title is Dragonfly. Faceless, we wander these trails until we see another like us, or not like us, another living thing with fractal eyes, face to face on the trail, another human face quietly interrupts the day so full of mechanical thinking. Face to face with another hiker, my world opens on a hinge, a dragonfly in her palm barely flickers light from its iridescent wings. Is hospice possible? for a too slow dragonfly in winter. She goes on, I go on, we all go on living as long as we can. Beauty and death, death and beauty. With light touch, we carry the faceless, the weightless. In the season of the urgent dragonfly seeking a meal, whatever can be found on acorn, mid-air, or on skin. The lucky in all this world are those handed gently into the next. And I wanna finish up with this poem, bringing us back to Sonoma County, back to my backyard. I'm bringing us to Helen Putnam Park and uh, a well-loved oak. This poem plays homage to uh, the 17th century Japanese poet Matsuo Basho, who wrote, to know the pine, you must go to the pine. So to know the oak, I went to the oak. Go to the blue oak. If you hike the oak woodland in winter, you may see death and find the blue oak heavily likened, little decoration and little reason to stay and contemplate life. But to know an oak or person well, it helps to befriend them all seasons. The blue oak's craggy fingertips may seem to have let go of leaves of life, but in the deciduous cycle of renewal, look for buds underneath primed to sprout come spring, you will find them. The genus Quercus means fine tree. Look closely and you may agree after all, this specimen is a fine survivor with two chest high holes in heartwood. Wood nymphs would know better than to shy away from this blue oak's perceived handicap. They know the undercurrent of death within the living. They know the dance that marks the harvest and closes the circle in autumn. 
this blue oak is still vigorous enough to produce a few acorns, potential offspring. If spring is the season of hope, then the oak will not disappoint you when you pass by often, deliberately waiting to see fresh dabs of green upon its gray palette of bark. Come summer, the tree will not crown you with a huge halo of shade, but will protect you enough from the sun and from Apollo's piercing eyes to enjoy a granola bar or sandwich, or moment of peace and quiet, which no mortal or nymph can take away. Come, let's navigate the seasons. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, everyone. Wishing you all happy holidays. Great. <laughs>